Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Todd Goldie, who is well recognized internationally for his pioneering work in Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Goldie is director of the Evelyn F. and William L. McKnight Brain Institute and One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He is a member of the Center for Transitional Research in Neurogenerative Disease and Professor, Department of Neuroscience and Neurology, College of Medicine, University of Florida, Gainesville. His presentation today, How We Change Understanding of Alzheimer's Disease from Poorly Treatable, Inevitable, and Incurable to Treatable, Preventable, and Curable. Dr. Goldie, welcome. Well, thank you, and I appreciate everybody's flexibility for um, being able to change the time. So let me share my screen. And, um, you know, I, I prefer these where we could have inter exchange during the talk, but if, if um, I know that that's hard over Zoom and um, I, uh, you know, of course, we'll try to keep this uh, in a way that will make it understandable. And if there's stuff that isn't, we could discuss it at the end. And um, just some disclosures. Uh, I will talk about something that's actually been licensed to and Dante Biologics um, that I think is exciting, but uh, a, a new startup locally. So, um, so I just want to, you know, my work for over 30 years has been on Alzheimer's disease. And I think when I began this journey and was involved in some really exciting findings in the early 1990s, we thought we'd have been a lot further along in the uh, on, on a road to developing effective therapies, treatments, or prevention. Um, and I'll talk about why I think we haven't made that as much progress, but I think there's still some uh, hope for the future and the near, near future. Um, but then I'd like to just sort of talk about some of the things that are going on in my lab in particular, as well as some other labs at UF that we think are, are really valuable to this effort. Um, as well as some of the, the, the important changes that have occurred with respect to public policy um, and things that you could do um, to, to help ensure that, that we're successful in this battle. Because it's going to be, uh, it is a battle, and, it, and just like the battle on cancer, it's not going to be won in a single skirmish. Um, so, um, uh, and then I'll finally at the end conclude with some, some just a few things talking about uh, sort of our, our uh, work in, in the dementia and successful brain air, aging area at the broader UF campus that I think is just important for everybody to, to be aware of. Um, um, so uh, I guess this is not 117 years ago. I probably needed to change that, but uh, now uh, 120 years ago, um, uh, um, the sort of was when Alzheimer's disease began. There's some controversy actually over this because there's another physician um, named Oscar Fisher. Um, and uh, because of uh, uh, his uh, uh, ethnic background and, and uh, was not as prominent in the, in the German society, but also basically you could substitute many of the things that I talk about Dr. Alzheimer's um, making note of this disease, Dr. Fisher did as well. Um, but anyway, the, the, you know, it's not like Alzheimer's disease suddenly appeared in the early 1900s. It was just recognized then. And so um, the first um, person to uh, uh, be sort of marked in the literature as by Dr. Alzheimer's was this August D. And she was somewhat unusual because she was in her early 50s. So she, it turns out she has a familial form of Alzheimer's disease or a heritable form now that uh, uh, we, we know about this. But I always like to read from the monograph um, where they talk about uh, August D. and Dr. Alzheimer's describing her symptomatology, reduced comprehension and memory. So, you know, memory loss, that's what we all know about Alzheimer's disease. But also these things, aphasia, difficulty speaking, disorientation, unpredictable behavior, and paranoia. And for anybody who's had a, a friend, a loved one, a parent who has suffered from Alzheimer's disease, they know some of those psychiatric, more psychiatric-like symptoms are some of the hardest ones to deal with. So I always like to, to just refer to this is more than just memory loss. It affects most areas of higher order cognitive function and especially the behavioral disturbances are, are challenging for people to deal with. 
Alzheimer's disease, we now know, is by far the most common cause of dementia in the elderly. Um, if you're over 60 and you have progressive loss of cognitive decline, about 65 to 70 percent of the time it will be Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are a whole bunch of other diseases that um, mimic as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you know, vascular dementia is probably the one that's, that's most typically confused where you have a series of small infarcts in the brain that could sort of mimic this. Um, um, and, you know, the, the, I think Alzheimer's disease, of course, is, is one of the, the challenges of the disease is it's insidious and it's slow. So it's, it's pretty, you know, people don't die per se of having Alzheimer's disease. They die of the consequences of having Alzheimer's disease because ultimately they can become bedridden and incapacitated. Um, so what is Alzheimer's disease? And really, Dr. Alzheimer's and Dr. Fisher deserve credit because they using blunt, very blunt tools to stain the brain at postmortem describe pretty much what we do today. We know, now know a lot more at the molecular level of what these are. But Alzheimer's disease at, is characterized by the presence of two lesions in the typical cases. There could be other things going wrong as well, but the typical ones are these plaques called a beta plaques um, and tangles. And the plaques um, formed by amyl or amyloid plaques are extracellular deposits of, of a protein we now know is referred to as the amyloid beta protein or a beta. And you can see in the cortex, these they're just littered with these. And you can see they're sort of um, when you slice a brain, these are sort of spherical lesions, so they look like a circle on, on the um, plaque or, uh, or on the slide. Um, you could also see on the right the tangles, which are tau, and these accumulate both in the cell bodies and in all the neuronal processes. And it's, it's actually quite interesting that they cluster around the amyloid plaque. So you, Alzheimer's disease is a disease where you have neurodegeneration and plaques and tangles because there are other forms of dementias that, for example, only have tangles and it's not Alzheimer's disease. Um, so back in the day when I began working in this space, there was a lot of controversy over what caused Alzheimer's disease. And I think if it wasn't for genetics, as I'll discuss in a few minutes, we would still be having this argument about whether these are tombstones and just markers of disease are really um, play a role. And there's some, there's still sort of an old joke um, because amyloid beta protein um, was discovered as the main component of the plaques in the mid 1980s and the tau, a protein that's a part of the neuronal cytoskeleton. So part of the, you could think of the structural components of the neuron was so people would call that this was largely whether you believe that plaques or tangles were more important to the disease was was largely a matter of faith and so we sometimes referred to the people that cited on the plaques as baptist and the tangles as taoist um, but i think we've moved beyond that um, so genetics has been really important as it has with many many other diseases and i see dr ken burns is on here and of course um, though he's not a classic geneticist, he did run the Genetics Institute and, um, of, of course, understands the importance of genetics with our understanding. And um, I'll, I'll get into this in a little more, but by understanding there, there are um, what we call heritable forms of Alzheimer's disease. These are typically earlier onset. So when people get it in families, they typically get Alzheimer's disease in their 40s to uh, sit, uh, 40s and 50s, as opposed to 70s and 80s. Um, though genetics does play a, a component or have an impact on the standard late onset Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, there are genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease where people get it in their 30s. Um, and over the last 25 years, we've largely laid out the genetic architecture of Alzheimer's disease, except perhaps for very, very, very rare mutations that affect very, very few people. And I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, except to say that everything that's not underlined is a gene that we know is has alterations and functional alterations in it. 
and that having these can cause Alzheimer's disease. And this really helped us because all the three genes that we know are causal in causing familial forms of Alzheimer's disease impact a beta metabolism. But even more compelling is the fact that, for example, the amyloid beta protein precursor gene that encodes this amyloid peptide that deposited is not only has a risky variant that in these families causes early onset Alzheimer's disease. In Iceland, they found a protective variant that reduces production of this protein, prevents its accumulation, so people don't get a beta accumulation and they're protected from cognitive deficits late in life and they're protected from Alzheimer's disease. Similarly, the apolipoprotein E gene which has a risky variant in it, the E4. And so if you have one copy, you're at medium risk. If you have two copies, you're at high risk. Has a protective variant. And again, people who have two copies of this pretty rare variant, but normal variant in, in the population, basically don't get Alzheimer's disease or, or very few of them do. Um, so I think that's, it's really compelling and how these other genes impact Alzheimer's disease is, is still uncertain. Many of these are not really a gene yet. They're a loci under which part of the chromosome where there are five or six genes and we don't know which one of them is contributing to disease. But we do know some clues that some of the newer genes on, on the map are in fact relate to the scavenging cells in our brain called microglia. That, clear proteins and things like TREM2 and ABI3 for just for naming. And I'll, I'll come back to that a bit at the end. And this is just sort of a, a map of, of how genetics has given us a handle on causality in Alzheimer's disease. So we have many genetic alterations that are associated with accelerating this process of amyloid deposition. And I'm not gonna go into the details of that. Um, we have also genetic alterations that appear to in decrease the likelihood that you get amyloid deposition. I talked about this one specific variant in Iceland, um, but more recently they found a form of APOE. Um, there's a kindred in Colombia that's been intensively studied because it's got, these people have a mutation in a gene called presenilin that regulates production of the amyloid beta peptide. And um, in this family, the average age of our, this extended kindred, who all have the same mutation, uh, it's been involved in some prevention studies. Um, there's one woman who has escaped, some people might've seen this in the New York Times, she's 30 years past the average age of onset. And it turns out she has this incredibly rare variant of this apolipoprotein E gene that seems to interfere. Um, we're still trying to figure out the biology, but we think what happens here is that this interferes with the ability of APOE and A beta to interact with something called heparin sulfate in the plaque. Um, we also, I referred to this idea that microglia that would normally try to clear A beta have gene genetic alterations in them that seem to uh, implicate that in Alzheimer's disease. And even though it's not a Alzheimer's gene, the gene that encodes tau um, does have mutations in it, and this causes a tangle-only dementia. So even though Alzheimer's disease is a uh, complex disorder with both of these proteins accumulating, we think that a beta accumulation is the trigger, and tau is maybe closer to the executor, but still important, even though uh, it's indirectly genetically implicated in the disease. And so the field has come under a lot of grief for this hypothesis or this framework that many people have referred to as the A-beta aggregate cascade hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease. But I think it's pretty hard to run away from this given the genetics. And that is that you get a beta accumulation in your brain. This leads to all sorts of other pathologies brain cell loss and dysfunction and dementia and brain organ failure eventually. And, and I think part of the problem with our field has been that we've drew this in a linear, um, you know, it, 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 it's nice, it's simple, but it's a hypothesis, but it fits pretty much all our observations. But what happens once a beta deposits and how does it lead to brain cell loss and dysfunction? We know tau is important, 
remain somewhat obscure, and I'll talk about our work in this area. But the, really what it said from a therapeutic point of view, much like when we think of atherosclerotic disease, you know, once you've had four heart attacks and are in heart failure, taking a statin really doesn't do that much. You need things that make your heart work better. But what the Alzheimer's field has done is tried to target a beta in the setting of overt dementia and people who are symptomatic. And, and we've not had very good results from that. Um, I think one of the huge um, aspects of, of advances that we have made is that we've been able to now visualize these pathologies using imaging agents, so a PET scan, and, and that coupled with MRI, and now with blood-based myomarkers, we could detect Alzheimer's disease before it occurs in humans, or the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, before you get symptoms. And, and so we now know that, that what we knew from autopsy studies cross-sectionally, we now know in individual humans that first you deposit A beta, and that could be seen with this PET scan. Then you begin to get neurodegeneration. I'm not showing it here, but we now have PET ligands that could detect tau. And right around this time, when you begin to see neurodegeneration, you see tau coming along. And then later on, you'll get both amyloid tau progressive neurodegeneration and you'll eventually get symptomatic. But, and this process on average takes anywhere from 15 to 20 or more years. So much like, you know, the analogy is really strong to atherosclerotic coronary artery disease where cholesterol deposits in your arteries long before you have, um, you know, infarcts in your heart and, and heart damage. Um, notably, I'm not going to talk about this too much today, but not only in the last year or two, the blood-based biomarkers that reflect the development of amyloid pathology have come along. We also have blood-based biomarkers that can detect neurodegeneration and even inflammation. And I think they're not quite as um, useful in, in the research setting as the scans, but they do really help us to uh, uh, you know, stratify people for clinical trials or see where to really determine whether somebody has Alzheimer's disease or, or not. Um, I'd, but I'd like to make the point that this is not, you know, that's just what happens when you're 60, you know, in the typical person who maybe is or is not depositing Alzheimer's amyloid and, and then will go on to put in the future to get Alzheimer's disease is not, you know, there's a lifelong journey of a healthy brain into Alzheimer's disease. And, and as I say, what I like to call brain organ failure, these genetic factors influence the brain physiology throughout most, if not all of the lifespan. Um, we also know that people with higher IQ or more educational attainment don't get diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the same way. And we don't, the, the data there is sort of interesting. It's probably that they just, they, they could withstand the damage to their brain better before they show symptoms. It's not that they don't have the pathologies. In midlife, we know that there are lots of things that influence whether or not you get Alzheimer's or get dementia later in life, not necessarily Alzheimer's disease such as high blood pressure. So controlling your blood pressure in midlife is important more than it is later in life. Um, but also things, just lifestyle factors, exercise, obesity, all those kinds of things, maybe altering them late in life isn't that useful with respect to um, what goes on late at, in, 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 in impending Alzheimer's pathology, but modifying them during this midlife sort of phase. And, and I don't know how to actually think of that where I think there's controversy or it's not settled in the field, but at least I think of this as probably modifying your reserve, i.e. rather than, we don't have too many of these directly linked to whether or not you're getting pathology. And then these function, these sort of sequence of events that I list here that I showed in the last slide, you get a beta deposition, you get cellular dysfunction, neurodegeneration, tauopathy. And of course, this all occurs in the setting of additional age-related comorbidities. So 
if we think about what happened from the days of Alzheimer's disease and uh, or also Dr. Alzheimer's diagnosing this this first index patient and and are under you know and then we we've made a huge amount of progress you know we now know we really have a much better definition of what Alzheimer's disease is the sequencing of events as AD progresses and most importantly I think from in terms of having a transformative impact ultimately on care of people with Alzheimer's disease, the ability to detect these events in living humans even before the disease appears. But there's still many gaps in our knowledge and of course we uh, have not yet translated this into effective therapies that really help. So we have a variety of interventions that can target the underlying pathologies but we ha these haven't worked definitively in humans yet and I'll discuss a little bit about that why. We do have some modestly effective therapies that can impact symptoms, but not for uh, very well. And of course we have hundreds of failed therapeutic studies. So there is a huge unmet medical need. And, and you know, I think though that we can now say that AD has finally captured the public attention and, and public policy has, has changed dramatically to to reflect that in terms of funding and awareness. And I just like to make the point that when I sort of began my work in Alzheimer's disease as an MD PhD student back at Case Western, you know, that was right when the HIV epidemic had, had really come to the forefront. And if we think about this, you know, Magic Johnson got diagnosed with HIV in 1991. And Ronnie Reagan, of course, had, President Reagan clearly had Alzheimer's disease probably in the later stages of his presidency, we now know that he certainly had the pathology because he had to, because he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1994 and of course passed a few years later. So I just want to make the, the point, there was a huge difference in funding for many, many years. And, and the same, I'll just use something like around 2000, there was $3 billion of NIH funding for HIV. And there was about $300 million of, of funding for Alzheimer's disease. And with the lat latest budget um, passage over the last five years, I think we've now increased Alzheimer's disease and related dementia funding by sixfold. So we're now at that above $3 billion in funding. And so again, I, this, I probably need to update this slide. Um, uh, you know, the NIH budget has, has dramatically increased. Philanthropy is increasing um, awareness of this disease is, you know, I think if, when people ask elderly individuals, what's, what do you worry most about? Many of them will answer getting Alzheimer's disease. Um, I would just like to say that, that the, you know, um, through efforts of a, of a, a benefactor of the University of Florida, um, we've been able to get some state support. Um, he helped us with some lobbying efforts and over time, various state legislatures who have been personally affected by this. It, it is, remains, I think, one of the few areas that is, um, has bipartisan support, maybe along with cancer and a few others. But, um, you know, I think it's important that we keep the pressure on. Um, this is, again, a, a, a long-term battle. We haven't yet translated this, this increase in funding into true success at the level of patient um, um, interventions that help. So we need to keep the pressure on. And I think as we should be optimistic about the future, but um, without this funding increase, we're, uh, progress will be slow. Um, these funds and awareness impact us locally. Um, uh, you know, nearly 10% of all the people with Alzheimer's in the country live in Florida. Um, I think it's now 6 million individuals. Um, again, this could probably be updated, but um, for example, we are the only, and I lead this effort, it's a consortium between University of Florida, Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, University of Miami, FAU and FIU. Um, we have one of the NIH funded Alzheimer's disease research centers that we refer to as the One Florida ADRC. And actually we were able to get this before the increase in funding came through. So it was first awarded in 2015. Uh, and we successfully renewed this grant for five more years, but as opposed to the first cycle where we had a, a million dollars of money to spend on research, in this cycle we now had two million because of this increase in funding. And that's huge because we were having to bring 
a dollar to the table to execute what we needed to as a new member of this club. But um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to do to it, within the One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is a very clinically oriented grant and really uh, has a, uh, outreach efforts, et cetera, which this is part of um, to here. So um, again, these are sort of our main goals of this grant. Um, and, and really our, our focus has been on trying to understand Alzheimer's disease in more diverse populations. Um, much of what we understand about AD, like many disorders, has come from the study of Caucasians of Northern European descent. Um, our, as a new ADRC, we actually see and have retained and recruited the highest percentage and largest number of Hispanic uh, individuals of any Alzheimer's center, despite many of these being around over 30 years. Um, and obviously then sort of the standard things that we do, we, we have a, a cohort that we follow longitudinally as they either age healthily or progress towards Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we encourage these recruits to get into novel treatment arms and, and uh, you know, contribute. We also do a lot of research on this, although the, the grant mechanism has changed in its focus. Um, but again, uh, the, uh, we, we are excited by this and with the increased funds, we will now have clinical core activity, which is sort of the heart of this grant, which I'll discuss later here at the University of Florida. Our IRB has finally been approved and we'll now be able to launch this. So this really is, it gets at the crux of, of I think, why we failed. Um, if, why don't we have better treatments? And, and I think in many cases, we took drugs that were unlikely to work as well as they had been purported in, in, um, in models of Alzheimer's pathology into the clinic. But more often than that, we've just tested them at the wrong time. And I sort of alluded to this um, before, I'm sorry, I didn't, this isn't um, animated. Um, we've basically been testing drugs, let's say that target a beta. So the idea is that these are designed to clear amyloid from the brain. Well, it looks like they do or can, but we've been testing them after the amyloid's been deposited for 30 years and all of this other stuff has gone on, including a lot of neuronal loss. So why would removing the triggering insult be regenerative? Well, it doesn't look like it's going to be. And what we need to do, and there are efforts underway to do this, is to begin to test these in primary prevention, i.e. even before this begins, or in secondary prevention with people who are, before they show symptoms or have evidence of neurodegeneration, we clear out this pathology. And I think this, this is important as we move forward. We've spent a lot of money in these in trials and uh, you know, market capital. I don't know if people have followed the story of Biogen's drug, Atacunumab, but um, it, you know, it, was, it looks like it will remove amyloid from the brain. They had some data that suggested maybe it was doing a little bit in, in terms of cognitive benefit, but that was being tested in the symptomatic phase. Uh, and, when they pushed that data out and said it looks good, um, you know, their, over time, their market cap of the company rose by something like $20 billion. The day that it was, they discontinued the trial initially, it, and within an hour, they lost $20 billion of market cap. And then they revital, they, they said, well, we reanalyzed the data and we think it maybe is doing something. Again, the, uh, the market cap of the, of the, the, the stock went up $20 billion again, so roughly a third of their value. And then the reverse happened when it was just reviewed at the FDA and the FDA was encouraged by it, but an, a group of outside physicians who I would side with said, we don't think it's really doing much. These trials aren't convincing. And it, 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 it's an antibody therapy, so it requires just an infusion. And um, I'm not, it's, I don't know if it's doing enough to warrant its approval at, at this stage. Um, but I'll, I'll skip that. But I would just say that despite the lack of success to date, we do have lots of, of, of drugs in tr trials. Some of these are showing a little bit of effects in, in areas that are, um, I, I, I talked about before, for example, agitation and aggression 
Um, we haven't been able to treat that very effectively. And there have been some new drug approvals in Alzheimer's disease for drugs that target those symptoms. Although, you know, that's a pretty late event typically in the disease. And, and really those are, are just designed to, to, you know, maybe keep somebody at home for a little while longer so that, that be, because it makes their, that aspect of their symptomatology um, better. But I'd be happy to talk about what these drugs are and what I think are more promising. This is a complex slide. It's just saying that we are having more shots on goal, but we still, I'm not sure that very many of these are really good shots on goal. Um, and, and we're gonna need better over time to make a difference. And I'll just give you one example, and this is a complex slide, and I don't really want to get into the details of it, but my lab, for example, has been working on agents that target tau. And in fact, there are antibodies targeting tau in the clinic, and several of these have failed to date, and we don't think they're good enough to, to, to have actually have been moved. For example, we have one that moves pathology around just about as well as anything that's been moved to the clinic in an animal model of tau pathology. And I don't want to get into the details here, but what I want to make a point is that our best agent that targets tau still, when we look at actually effects on neurodegeneration, which in this model we could tell by onset of a, a, a paralytic phenotype, it only prolonged survival by about 18%. And that's in a homogeneous genetic model. We just don't think this is good enough to see an effect on the neurodegenerative phase of Alzheimer's disease. And so again, we think these agents, tau occurs fairly early in the disease process. It's after amyloid, but it's still before you show symptoms. We think we need to target this a lot earlier. Um, I also think that this idea that you're gonna cure Alzheimer's disease with a single approach to uh, a, a agent is, is probably misled um, you know, once you're symptomatic, you know, if, if you think of organ failure for diseases, you know, when you're heart, in heart failure, you usually take a bunch of different drugs to make your heart beat better, not just one agent. And I think that's the way we have to approach Alzheimer's disease or the alternative to that, which I call a magic cocktail is sort of a magic shotgun. And I'm going to describe one here that I think is pretty neat that's come out of my lab. And you really don't pay attention to any of the text on this slide. If people are, we're, we're, I think we, we all are pretty familiar with stress this year. We've been in through an incredibly stressful year and we st probably still face a few more days at least of pretty incredible stress and uh, uh, at least six more months of, of stress due to COVID. Um, but when the body's stress response begins with uh, the brain sensing, you know, some sort of stressor, and there's a characteristic response in which you release a hormone from the hypothalamus called CRF that goes to the pituitary gland where it releases another hormone that goes to your adrenal glands and releases cortisol. And I think many of us are aware of all the effects if somebody's been on prednisone or whatever, an, an exogenous cortisol, they know some of the effects of this. But um, for various reasons, there have been some loose linkages between Alzheimer's and stress in the literature. And, and my lab began to investigate this because there were some direct links between CRF, this protein that's the initiator of the stress response and production of A-beta. And we, we, through that work, we, we ended up saying, you know, if we're gonna drug this, people had tried to drug this pathway for many years, we need to do it with an antibody. And again, I don't wanna get into the details of why, but we did this and I just wanna show why we're excited about this. And so, Basically, um, the way you test for uh, stress in a, in, a, in a mouse model is you stick them in a conical tube for 30 minutes, so they call it restraint stress. And um, at this point, you can see in mice, the equivalent of human cortisone is, or cortisol is corticosterone. It goes through the roof and then normalizes. If we pre-dose the mice with our antibody, we could almost completely block this stressor. And Again, in humans, a condition known as Cushing syndrome is cortisol excess. And you could see this is pretty much what we think we could target in humans with this antibody because people with Cushing syndrome get central obesity, they lose muscle mass in their limbs, they get depression, 
they get anxiety, they have a whole osteoporosis, you could go through a litany of, of changes that occur. And this is due to excess cortisol that's largely driving this, although most of the time in humans, Cushing's is caused either by exogenous corticosteroids or a pituitary tumor making too much ACTH. But we could essentially reproduce this in a mouse model by overexpressing CRF instead of, and you get a fat mouse with what looks like this buffalo hump that people have called, and you lose hair. And a single injection of this antibody will basically reverse that phenotype, which is pretty cool if you think about it. But again, um, I also wanna just mention, if you think about, um, people have called this, uh, that there's a cortisol theory of aging. What, pretty much all of us as we get older, you know, we wish our, we had bigger peripheral muscles, less central fat, um, and we want to preserve our brain health. And so we think this has some impacts beyond just that. I won't go through this to, except to say that um, through some really wonderful work by Hunter Futch, an empty PhD student in my lab, um, we identified that actually this antibody reverses stress-induced uh, changes in body composition and, and weight. Um, and increases muscle mass. And we've gone on since that to show that um, even mice on high fat diet, this the, treatment with this antibody will block these increases in, in weight gain that you see, or at least attenuate them. And quite surprisingly, they'll preserve, and I apologize for the, the way this appears, but it'll preserve brain weight in the setting of a high fat diet, which is thought to shrink the brain. And this is an ongoing experiment, so we don't have all the controls. And again, another MD, PhD student in the lab, Zach Crumbs, carrying these on. So we're excited about this in a number of conditions, but we, you know, my heart is still in Alzheimer's disease. And so we're, we're still interested in this on, on its impacts on Alzheimer's disease. And again, thinking more holistically about Alzheimer's, it occurs in the setting of aging. And we know that at least for dementia, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and diabetes are all risk factors. And so we're excited by this ability to block CRF and have a multitude of impacts, including those directly on AD relevant pathologies. And I, one of the things that really excited me about this when I really went back in the literature on Cushing syndrome, people with Cushing syndrome develop a small, they, their hippocampus shrinks. And so the hippocampus is the seat of our short-term memory in the brain. And we know that it's also shrinks in Alzheimer's disease. Again, if you remove the tumor that's driving or the, ex the exogenous cortisol that's driving Cushing syndrome, the hippocampus actually regrows and in, in people or seems to in, at least you know, normalizes its size which is pretty cool and, and points, points to the potential of this. Um, so the other thing that I think that, that is inhibiting, um, um, I'm gonna skip that slide, um, it's not supposed to be in there, uh, are these enigmatic aspects of the, of the what I call the amyloid cascade hypothesis. We're pretty confident in this idea that amyloid accumulates over time and triggers this downstream neuro dysfunction but we really don't know how it does it. And, and um, there, I think we probably thought about this too simplistically. And one of the things that we know now at, was beginning to emerge from a collaborative study that's um, I'm working with our new neuropathologist, Stefan Prokop and Yona Levitez on is a bunch of other proteins co-accumulate in the plaque. And I just wanna um, show that this is again, also a collaboration with Emory and so, it's funny, we were working on the mouse model of amyloid deposition and Emory was doing this on humans with Alzheimer's disease. And what we find is in addition to amyloid accumulating, we find a whole host of other proteins accumulating. And the cool thing here is that the mouse and the human, our mouse model of amyloid pathology and human AD show a huge overlap. And I, I don't wanna belabor this too much, but we've been making antibodies to look at these more closely and see what they actually look like in the brain. And you can see things and the names probably don't matter. This is amyloid and what it looks like. And I'll show a couple more slides of this, but these are new proteins that have not been shown to be in plaques before. 
that we now know accumulate. And it turns out that they are growth factors in many cases. So we think that the abnormal accumulation of these proteins in the plaque may be playing a role in triggering the downstream dysfunction. And the cool thing is we have a lot of work here to do because we've got 20 or 30 new what we call amyloid associated proteins to begin to work with. Another closer look at one of these is, um, this is again amyloid staining in an Alzheimer's brain on the bottom. And this is something called midkine. It's a very potent growth factor with also cytokine-like properties that accumulates in the brain. And you could see wherever A beta accumulates, it's accumulating. And in fact, if I showed this picture to a pathologist and didn't tell them it was midkine, they'd think it was amyloid. Um, even in am A beta can accumulate in the cerebral vessels, and that's shown here. So you can see that on the bottom, but it also accumulates in the plaques. And again, just a little, just cool. It, we see this in all our mouse models. And Green is a amyloid accumulating and pink is midkind. So it's, it's got a very specific location in the plaque, which we find really cool. So again, we're, we're excited about this and there's a lot of work to do and we've just submitted a grant on it, but we think it could help us to identify new targets and understand this transition from amyloid, which by itself seems to be necessary to get Alzheimer's disease, but not sufficient. You have to have these downstream changes and maybe these proteins are mediators. Tau has been much harder. We have had lots of ways to intervene targeting amyloid, but tau has been much harder. And some of that has been because the model systems to study tau are more challenging. And I don't wanna go into this in, in, in great detail, but recently a, a, a very talented postdoc in the lab developed truly a brain uh, uh, this is actually a, a slice of a brain that we culture in a dish. And every one of these green dots that you see is in fact a tangle occurring within 28 days in this brain slice culture. And this is for Ken. We drove this using adeno-associated viral vectors over expressing specific forms of tau. And to our knowledge, these things are truly tangles. So it gives us the first opportunity to really reproduce this pathology outside of a living brain in a way that's robust and we could begin to test drugs and agents. Um, we also know, uh, this is work from uh, um, uh, uh, Jada Lewis and, and Dave Borschelt's lab who have collaborated. You know, one of the, the enigmatic aspects is amyloid must talk to tau, we think, you know, but nobody knows how. And again, it's been hard to reproduce this in a model that we could test. But they've now shown that when they take a mouse that has only tau and gets tau pathology and cross this with a model of amyloid pathology in a very specific way that there is crosstalk. So every one of these dark brown dots is a tangle. And you can see that only in the presence of the amyloid model, and that should be amyloid, um, not uh, do you get this synergy. So we now think we have a way or a model system in which we begin, begin to understand what are the factors that are talking between each other because we think each of those would represent a target. And this is a very complex slide, but it's building off of the work that we can make a tangle in a dish. And I just, you know, so one peep thing that is in the field, these, when you form these lesions, they're fibrillar, they're insoluble. A lot of people think this is just like a, a tomb. It's, it's like the, Tau is deposited and it just sits there. Well, we now have data using some really cool sort of optical imaging and, and what we call an optical pulse chase experiment that tangles turnover. And this is consistent with some other very initial data in the literature. But the idea is that even when these tangles form and may be very important in Alzheimer's and driving Alzheimer's pathology, they may be reversible. And in fact, we could show that even in this culture model, just aging them extends the half-life a bit, but no matter how old they are, they still turn over. So again, an opportunity towards, um, towards developing new therapies for tau and if we could understand what is turning it over in the cell. And then I'm not gonna go in this, this in any great detail, but some really cool genetic engineering in the lab that we hope one day will turn into a gene therapy. Um, We've sort of taken a picture out of the CAR T cell uh, therapies for cancer. 
And in this case, we know that microglia eating amyloid or perhaps even tau might be a good thing in the brain. And what we've done is we've engineered vectors to enable cells to eat micro um, eat um, amyloid or tau more efficiently. So without this uh, genetically engineered construct in it, you can see the red is the uptake of amyloid beta protein or tau. And when we introduce the right vector in here, we could make these cells eat amyloid or tau a lot better. So we're excited about that. And just to conclude, there's some other, other initiatives related to dementia research underway at UF. Um, there's some non-pharmacologic and behavioral interventions. Some of you, who knows, may be participating in these. Um, there's a habit program, which is really about a sort of a wellness program run by Glenn Smith, who's chair of clinical health psychology. There's the ACT program run by Adam Woods and Ron Cohen, as well as many other studies, Embark and other things looking at successful aging um, through uh, the funding of the McKnight Brain Research Foundation, uh, as well as things like intermittent hypoxia, uh, more at the preclinical stage now, but with uh, designs to move that towards the uh, clinical stage. Um, our ADRC studies, as I mentioned, will launch here shortly um, within the Fixell Institute uh, with a focus on dementia in the setting of Parkinsonism. Um, that's really our strength, and, and as an initial state, we'll be going there. But this has really made us think about our infrastructure for clinical research in this space. And Mike Oaken and I and others are currently in, in the process of raising funds to build next to Fixel a state-of-the-art clinical research imaging suite. Um, so instead of having to go, if you get seen at Fixel and need an imaging study, hopefully you'll be able to walk next door to get an amyloid pet or a tau pet or an MRI um, or other uh, advanced uh, assays that will be useful, as well as to build more clinical trial infrastructure. I'm sure this is on people's um, uh, minds. You know, COVID clearly has long-term effect on the brain. Stefan Prokroff is going to receive a, a, a grant from the state to um, collect brains. He's our neuropathologist of people who had previously had COVID and then go on to die for some other reason to help understand what are some of the long-term impacts. And there are many other studies I'm sure that will be funded over time of looking at how COVID impacts. Our Alzheimer's disease uh, center is looking at that more from just, you know, COVID clearly because of its isolation and other things have, has a, a severe impact on, on elderly population because you're, you're so at risk for it. Um, you know, this, there's been a lot of talk about how the immune system impacts Alzheimer's disease. And we're um, very interested in, in uh, studies that have been led by Link Moldau or Fred Moore and others in surgery, where they've been looking at sepsis and its impact on the whole body. But we think there are real opportunities to understand better how the immune system and infection impacts brain health, especially in the elderly, by collaborating with them. Um, there's a, a an effort underway that was funded by the UF Moonshot that um, we're now trying to get outside funding, um, which is, you know, the, one of the, the challenges when, and there's some really uh, laudatory studies that people all know about, they've heard about the over 90 study or, you know, uh, people who have lived to 100. Why do, why do they, you know, escape the ravages of, of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases that affect other people? And um, the problem with many of these studies is that they're pretty small. They're 100 people or 200 people, and typically they're not very diverse. So we've been working to try to see if we could develop novel paradigms to identify healthy brain agers in the state of Florida at a population level, leveraging the Clinical Translational Science Institute One Florida Data Trust. So basically develop a computer algorithm based on mining these medical records, re out, reach out and, and contact these. And also, we've been growing a more diverse translational group of investigators, um, and we continue to hire in this space, both on the clinical and basic side. And so I, this, I don't want to spend a lot of time, this is nearing the end of what is the, the last slide here, but you know, if this is a, a new initiative, we know that we have several 100,000 people in the state of Florida over the age of 85, and using data within the One Florida Data Trust, we could actually identify those who are likely to be 
free of dementia and other ravages of, of the brain and recontact them and reconsent them for research. And again, we spent a ton of time trying to figure out what are the genetics that, you know, uh, predispose you towards getting Alzheimer's disease. But what are the, the genetics of, of factors that, or other factors that determine whether or not you get into your 90s and, and you're free of these? And um, we have a few clues from studies, but they're, they're not big enough. We know genetics needs power. So where we're starting, just because it's easy to spit in a tube and get the tube back, is trying to identify these people in Florida, hopefully get a more diverse group and do this not just with hundreds of people, but with thousands of people. So stay tuned. And, and if, if people would like to support this initiative, again, it's, it's been internally supported right now, but we're about ready to, to begin to, to get extramural funding. But we do think it's a real opportunity and it may be an opportunity for others, uh, you know, the general community to participate in, in a laudable research effort. And then, you know, while we're waiting for, for a drug for Alzheimer's disease or dementia, I think you know it's important that we keep the pressure up, and and so please you know if 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 you're interested in this space you know be a polite but a continue you know it, it's better for you to do it than than for me, um, even you know at the national and local and and state levels let them know that it's important and you care about this, and and of course we can't do this without your help you know that you know Alzheimer's disease does not have a, uh, a, a fully rep is not fully replicated in any of our models. The only way we really understand this disease is by studying people with it who are humans. And, you know, in order to test drugs, we need people that are willing to, you know, be a guinea pig. Um, and, and so I think in the future, we can imagine, you know, a future where we have changed our understanding of Alzheimer's disease from its current state where it's pretty inevitable. If you're gonna get it, you're gonna get it. We can't do very much on the treatment end and it's incurable to one where it's preventable, treatable and curable. And again, there are lots of places you could go for more information. Uh, if you wanna learn more about the One Florida ADRC, there's a website. Obviously if there's, you know, we totally revamped the MBI website. so. Um, and we have newsletters and if people want, would like to join and get those, their e-newsletters to know what's going on, um, please contact us. We've really ramped up our communication efforts, but the Alt Forum for people more scientifically inclined, as well as the Alzheimer's Association has some great websites for, for general information. And of course, if you're worried about your own, a family members or friends, cognitive health, contact us and we'll try to get you a, con a, a, a timely referral. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention and uh, um, be happy to ask, answer questions. Well, many thanks, uh, Dr. Goldie. I think this is a very timely topic and one that is gonna have continued interest for many, many years. We congratulate you on your great strides forward. I know there's a lot to be done. We probably have time for questions and I think if you wanna ask a question, you can raise your hand by going to reactions and putting your, uh, raising your hand. And I think uh, Julianne can call on you when uh, your hand's up. So any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Great presentation. Let me start with one from the chat box. It says, is there a model for understanding how public policy is being developed? The issue, is there a model for the development of public policy given all the competing stakeholders on the issue? Well, I, I mean, you know, I think this has actually been a success of the, you know, I hate to use the word lobbying, but, you know, money makes the, you know, monkey dance in politics. And um, both the Alzheimer's Association and the American Federation for Aging Research and, and um, you know, AARP, I think even have been pretty successful at the national level of raising awareness. And, you know, the, the, the Alzheimer's, uh, a plan to increase funding for Alzheimer's disease was put in place around 2013, and it's been pretty successful. Uh, at the state level, we've had a lot, you know, we, we, there was no funding for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's funding for the memory center, disorder centers. So there was funding for sort of care and diagnosis, but not for research. And thanks to Nick Ferrari and his efforts with a lobbying group and uh, um, uh, Matt Hudson, 
we were able to get a six million dollar grant um, program put in the state of Florida. So the best research that gets submitted will get funded, as well as been getting some funding directly to the University of Florida that largely supports our Alzheimer's disease research center efforts because even with the amount of money from the national level, uh, we, we support over 40 faculty on that grant. And so you could imagine that it doesn't go as far as you would like. So we need to leverage that with other funds. So, um, you know, I think there's been a lot. It's, you know, there's also been ep efforts on to understand the, the economic impact of Alzheimer's disease, which I think have, you know, were also very important. You know, the cost of Alzheimer's disease with lost wages, you know, caregiver burden, et cetera, is equal to that of, you know, on the par of that with cancer and heart disease. So in the 200 to $300 billion a year range. And I think that those kind of numbers help. So I hope you. that answers the question. Shirley, go ahead. Uh, hi, Dr. Goldie, great talk, great fight. I'm so glad that you mentioned the super agers. And I wanted to mention there are a group of us volunteering as super uh, successfully aging seniors talking to the medical students. And we meet with them periodically so that they don't have such a stereotype of aging people and recognize that there's some of us out here that are aging successfully and would like to be treated like we know what we're doing. <laughs> so I just wanted to let you know we're in the progress of trying to help medical students understand the difference. Great. Well, I, I appreciate that. I hope that I end up being a successful agent too. So I think we all want to, I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's important and, and, and I like to conceive of it as, I mean, the, the reason I got really interested in this was I had a collaboration that where somebody had identified a genetic uh, factor that was seem to be associated with, with protection from this apolipoprotein E allele that causes, you know, is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And I go, well, how do we validate this? And we said, there's no population to do it. We don't have, you know, we need, we would need thousands of people to replicate that. And so, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll have an opportunity if you want to, to, you know, we're going to try to, we're, we're sort of been in the pilot silent phase of this, but we, we really want, you know, Imagine if we could identify 30,000 people in Florida who were successful brain agers from all ethnicities, not just, you know, and, and understand, you know, is, is there, we don't know. I mean, we, it may not be that it's all, we know there's a lot of non-genetic factors that contribute here, but, you know, genetics is easy. We'll start there. Um, but, you know, we'd also love, you know, we, we are always, I, this is a little morbid and I don't want to, you know, but if, one of the big challenges that we always run into in, in our studies of postmortem human brain, which has been invaluable in our field, is we lack control brains. We lack people who are willing to donate their brain who don't have a, a, a disease. And so if anybody's willing to sign up for that, let me know and I'll contact you and we could run through that. I don't mean to, you know, this is <laughs> not my, my work, but it's so important. And, you know, there there's probably some, if you're over 90 and you're, free of dementia, there's probably something special about your brain. And we'd like to understand it so we can maybe pass that on to future people. I have already donated mine to Mayo. I've oh, been okay. for, for years there. So, but I wondered, have you done any work with ketogenic diets and their impact on brain metabolism? Not myself. I mean, that's a pretty controversial area. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's some interesting data out there. And, um, uh, but Sarah Burke, who's one of the, uh, um, part of the, the uh, Center for Aging and Memory and CTRP program that the McKnight Brain Research Foundation, not the Institute, funds and supports um, through, you know, partly through Lee Dockery's efforts, um, has, is looking at that in some of the preclinical models as well as in some clinical studies. And there's a, there's a lot of interest in that. And I think this idea that, you know, um, as uh, I think, you know, it, it's too early to know and, and um, but, but I think that these sort of non, as I said, I wouldn't call it a non-traditionally pharmacolo pharmacologic approach could have a big impact and we shouldn't be adverse to really trying to look at those rigorously. Right. I'd love to be a supporter of that because I attribute that to some of my success. Yeah. Okay. A couple more questions. Keith Berg, go ahead. Uh, yes. You, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago 
as well as uh, earlier. Can you hear me already? Yeah, I, I can't. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, these uh, apparently protective genetic uh, 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 elements in the brain. Uh, is there any thought of attempting to do manipulation of genetic structure to recreate those? Yeah, so the, the most, well, so the answer is yes, but it's very challenging. And if these exert a lifelong effect, will manipulating, for example, somebody's moving forward with a gene therapy to overexpress ApoE2, so this apolipoprotein form that's protective. I personally think that will be, a, because you're going to go into symptomatic people, it's too little too late. Um, so... I'll be happy to eat my words. I mean, I, I, you know, I always say that no matter what I should, I don't care whether I, there's no science behind it. We should never want to see another trial fail in Alzheimer's disease because we need something to work. Um, but I just, it, it gets back to this issue that I think that gene plays a role much earlier than at the stage of, of when you already have cognitive impairment. And if the only way to replace it is by a gene therapy, that's, that's a tough one to give to at least in this, you know, maybe 15 years from now when we're more comfortable with it, we'll be willing to do that to normal people. But right now, I think it's a, it's a reach. So um, I would say they're drugs, you know, so they're mutations in the amyloid protein precursor that increase production of A-beta. And we were very excited because we had drugs that could target that. Unfortunately, these didn't work in the, which wasn't that surprising in the setting of people with symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. But then they, through heroic efforts, there are these consortiums of prevention initiatives and these include in genetic, people who are genetically at risk for the disease. These drugs caused side effects on cognition that were reversible, but they did so very quickly and they had to be discontinued. And there's still argument about, I'm actually in the process of reviewing a paper suggesting that, you know, maybe we should move forward with a lower dose of these. But, you know, this was a huge effort. Perhaps, it's, you know, this is just for people who are in the science field, the, the amount of medicinal chemistry and drug development that went into targeting what's called this en enzyme called BASE was probably more than any other single pharmacologic target. So there was a huge industry investment in this and it was very challenging, but they got there, but then they had unexpected side effects. So I think, you know, that's the challenge of, of treating people in this asymptomatic phase. If you don't have symptoms, you have to have something as safe or, and I actually think in this regulatory environment, safer than a statin, something that lowers cholesterol. And it has to be a lot more effective because a statin, though they are effective, they would the, the and the general population, the efficacy of a statin, we if it, if we translated that to an efficacy of an Alzheimer's disease prevention, we'd never see it. You have to treat 23 people or so who are at high risk for atherosclerotic disease for five years before you see an effect on a cardiovascular event. We'd never see that in an Alzheimer's trial. So we got to work to do. It's going to be tough. Thank you, Karen Mary. Uh, yes, I read about a drug. Um, the name, well, the acronym is I S R I B, <laughs> to restore memory in uh, traumatic brain injury cases. And uh, somebody came up with a theory that this loss of memory was due to a reversible blockage. Uh, can you comment, please? Yeah, so actually I was the, the guy who developed that drug. I was on a, uh, they, one of the good things about COVID is we could do things like this and somebody's put an international group consortium called the Proteostasis Consortium. So this ISRA, what happens when you have injury sometimes is you block the production of proteins at the level of RNA. So, you know, you go DNA, RNA, protein. This prevents RNA from going to protein. And in some ways, this is an adaptive response, but sort of like chronic overactivation of your stress response, it could be bad, we think. Um, so this drug is, is actually reverses some of that. Um, it's 
but it, I, I'm, there's, there, there's some disconnects there. I, I've, I've seen, I looked at this and go, why isn't this in the water yet? Um, I think it's an exciting area of, of research, but I also think this is a fundamental process within the body that normally occurs. And I think there are concerns that, again, this issue of, is it going to be safe enough? And in what setting do you test it? I, I also think like many of these, when you think of traumatic brain injury, just like I talked about with Alzheimer's disease, there's a window of opportunity for each drug and when they need to be tested. And I don't think we've done a great job. And in many cases, we continue not to do a great job of identifying what that window is for a specific condition with a drug. And we say, well, this is how I could test it because I can, not because I, it's the best test, but it is the one that's been done before. So that's what I'm going to do. So I think it's a very interesting molecule and that whole pathway is in, of interest to, to me and actually a colleague of mine, Joe Abbasambra. Um, but I think there's a lot more to be learned and um, you know, it, 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 it would be a magic shotgun again. And the problem with magic shotguns is some pellets could go off and maybe cause some harm as well as some good. Yep. Thank you. Um, do you have a little bit more time, Dr. Goldie? I have one yeah. more question in chat. Sure, sure. Um, okay, it says, what about a study of certificate of death of dementia residents who do not donate their brains for postmortem studies? Well, the, the, you know, the truth is we can't handle the capacity of, you know, an autopsy is pretty labor intensive. And um, so we, we get plenty of brains from people who have Alzheimer's what, um, and people sign up, they want to know. And, you know, sometimes we find, okay, it's not Alzheimer's at, you know, it was diagnosed and it turns out not to be, or another disease was diagnosed, a rare form of dementia was diagnosed and it turns out to be Alzheimer's. So that's why an autopsy could be important, especially when there are some unusual aspects. Um, but, but in, in general, you know, if we have 300 brains in the brain bank that, began, you know, in 19, you know, 99 at UF, but it has, we've, we've sort of doubled down our efforts. Um, you know, we have maybe 20 control brains and most of the rest are all related to some form of disease. Um, so again, that, um, rep, especially when we start talking about um, uh, this issue of, you know, the, the vast majority of, in, throughout the country, most of the brains that exist in academic research brain banks are from individuals of Northern European descent and Caucasians. So um, we have to have an international or national effort just to identify a hundred brains from African-Americans or Latinos and almost none of those are control brains. So we, we, we have some gaps here because, you know, do, do, you know, we, in, in general, we think that, Alzheimer's disease presents pretty much the same way in an African-American or an Hispanic, somebody from Hispanic descent, but we really don't know. And we certainly don't know. We know genetic risk is a little different. Um, and we certainly know that comorbidities in different populations matter a great deal. So again, something that, that you know, we need to keep our eye on and, and um, you know, but, it, but it's hard. It's, you know, there's, there's, many reasons, you know, it's a, you know, heroic thing for a family and a, and a person to want to donate their brain. And um, there are some challenges and there's some educational, um, you know, uh, challenges to, you know, say that how, how is it done and people are just averse to it. Um, so um, again, but, you know, just even just in particular, you know, there are varying levels of willingness to participate in any form of research and, and, and some skepticism of the medical field and rightfully so. I'll let you know how it turns out. <laughs> well, my colleague Dennis Dixon will probably be the one who does the final diagnosis. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the final one in chat. Um, can you speak to the benefit of taking Prevagen? <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, I, I think Dr. my colleague, Dr. Dukoski, wrote a very nice article for the conversation that was covered on about the use of supplements and other kinds of things. And, and in general, there's no sci good scientific and medical evidence that any of these uh, work, uh, Prevagen included. Um, 
you know, there's, there are books by, about, you know, how to, you know, cure Alzheimer's disease where there's a financial motive and other kinds of things. I'm not going to say to anybody that they shouldn't take something if it seems to help and it's safe um, to them. But I think in general, the supplements and the ideas that these alter cognition in large studies, um, it remains unproven. Um, it's not always, some cases it's disproven. Um, um, things like vitamin E and D, um, you know, effects on cognition have, have been studied. Uh, the, I've seen no rigorous study of, of a trial of Prevagen. And, you know, I think one of the challenges is in our field is, is that especially in the early stages of, you know, when you might have, let's say, subjective memory complaints or think something's going wrong. You know, there are a lot of things that could cause very early alterations in cognition that are not Alzheimer's disease and are, you know, reversible. Depression's one of them. And so we always run into, in, in trials, um, you see what we call the placebo effect. And in, cognit in the cognitive domain, that placebo effect is large. And so if, if it's helping people, you, you should, I don't think we should tell them to stop taking it, but I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that it really is, is doing anything. Um, so, I, I mean, that's where we're at. And, and um, you know, as I said, if somebody um, certainly, you know, eating the the, there are large studies underway, but I, I think they'll be interesting. We know that what you did, you know, in midlife, eating a Mediterranean diet, staying physically active is protective for brain health later on. What we don't know is if you're elderly and worried about your cognition, if you change those habits now, will it affect you? And I think in general, we know that, you know, even when you're no matter at any age, having a healthy lifestyle helps. It might not necessarily help with the underlying disease process in, in with respect to Alzheimer's disease, but general fitness helps. I mean, staying mentally active, staying physically active and staying socially engaged, you know, are important. And God, we know that this year. I mean, you know, I think even for the, those of us who aren't, um, you know, quote, you know, are still in midlife, I, you know, it's been a stressful year and, and, you know, I think we all miss that, um, that those, you know, day-to-day -day social interactions. So I, 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 I hope that you all are getting vaccinated and, uh, or on the list and that, that hopefully we can return to some semblance of a normal society in, in, in a few, you know, in, in within a half a year or so. I think, you know, it, you know, it's been a long haul and I can't imagine um, the, the challenges many of you have faced. Well, thank you, Dr. Goldie. I think we've all learned quite a bit. And I just remind you all that Dr. Goldie and his uh, research team are over at the uh, uh, Brain Center here at UF and uh, can be uh, uh, arranged appointments with them if you, you so choose. Uh, meantime, uh, Dr. Goldie, we wish you the very best and success with your research program. Many thanks. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Cheers.